Okay, so for question 11, which row gives the correct explanation about these results? So why does the rate of reaction change with time? You can tell by the table already that the total volume of carbon dioxide gas that's given off keeps decreasing over time. So um, the reason for that is because there are fewer collisions between the reacting molecules occurring. So if you look at the first drawing that I drew, or the first box, you see that there's a lot of particles next to each other in a small area. So the likelihood of them actually colliding is much greater than in the second box. And it's not just that, but the fact that there are less reactants, that means there will be less products forming because the reactants keep decreasing and the number of reactants keep decreasing. So we don't know whether the answer now is A or B. So we're trying to find out why the reaction stops. Which one's the limiting factor? So we're going to calculate here. So one mole of calcium carbonate is 100 grams. And how many moles gives you 4 grams? We're going to cross multiply. And X is 0 0.04 moles of calcium carbonate. It gives us 4 grams, which is stated in the question. So now we need to find the number of moles of hydrochloric acid. So we use the formula C is equal to N over V. So concentration is equal to the number of moles over volume. So N is equal to C times V. You can use a triangle if you want to visualize it. To get N, you multiply C by V. To get V, you do N over C. To get C, you get N over V. So the concentration is 0 0.10 moles per decimeter cube times the volume, which is 100 centimeters cubed, yet you need to change it to decimeters cubed. That is why you divide by 1,000. So that gives you 0 0.01 mole. So we have 0.04 moles of calcium carbonate and 0.01 mole of HCl. This is actually the limiting factor because 2 moles of HCl should give you, uh, should be reacting with 1 mole of calcium carbonate. So if you were to double the calcium carbonate, so 0 0.04 times 2, that's 0 0.08. We're supposed to have 0 0.08 moles of HCl, except we have now only 0 0.01. So you know that HCl is the limiting factor and calcium carbonate is in excess. So then the answer will have to be B. Okay, so question 12. Why is the second ionization energy of sodium larger than the second ionization energy of magnesium? So the answer is going to be A. And why is that? It's because the attraction between the nucleus and the outer electrons is greater in the sodium plus than in the magnesium plus. Why is that? Because... Sodium has 11 electrons and has, and because it's in group 1, it has one valence electron. And we already lost that. So instead of having three shells, we only have two. So the distance between the nucleus and the outer electrons decrease. And so the force of attraction will be stronger and there is less electron pair repulsion. However, with the magnesium, it has 12 electrons. We lost one, but there's still one more. So we have three shells, not two. And distance is still great, and so that's why less energy is needed for it to be ionized. So that is why it is A. B, the nuclear charge of sodium plus is greater than uh, that of magnesium plus. That is not true because sodium has 11 protons, magnesium has 12. Then the outer electron of Na plus is more shielded than the outer electron of Mg plus. No, that is actually the opposite. Like I said, magnesium now is more shielded because it has three uh, shells of, or two shells in front of it compared to that compared to that of sodium with only one shell in between so then the outer electron of so of sodium is in the same orbital as the outer electron magnesium that is true but it has nothing to do with the second ionization energy and so your only possible answer is a and here's just a pick of it the shell consists of the subshells and the orbitals so you have the orbitals are the smallest thing, then you have the subshell, and then you have the entire shell. Okay, so make sure you actually know that. It will make it a lot easier for you. And now on to question 13. So we're trying to figure out which one has the best melting point, or the graph of the correct melting points of each element. So from sodium to magnesium, melting point increases. From magnesium to aluminum, melting point increases. And of course, from aluminum to silicon, Melting point also increases with silicon being the one with the greatest melting point. And of course, phosphorus is a gas, so right away you know that it has a low melting point. And the graph that shows that this is right is B. Now, why does magnesium aluminum have a greater melting point than magnesium, for example? We're just going to 
draw out the metallic lattice so you know we have the magnesium cations and the delocalized C of electrons, right? So now Mg2 plus and aluminum is 3 plus. So you know that the positive charge density is greater in aluminum than magnesium. And so the force of attraction is greater and it's going to need more energy to separate compared to magnesium. And the same thing with silicon. So that is why you have the order of phosphorus, then magnesium, then aluminum, then silicon in this case. Now, question 14. An excess of magnesium oxide is shaken with water. The resulting mixture is filtered into test tube X. And then an excess of barium oxide, the same thing, into test tube Y. So now, as you go down the group, the hydroxide's solubility increases. So magnesium oxide is more likely to dissolve than beryllium oxide and calcium oxide is more likely to dissolve than magnesium oxide and so which one is more readily uh, which one reacts more readily with water that would be barium oxide so the answer is either A or B now which filtrate has a lower pH of course the one with the lower pH that means that there are more H plus ions or less OH ions in that test tube or that filtrate so when you react uh, the magnesium hydroxide or just separate into its um, ions you have the hydroxide ions and the magnesium and because barium oxide reacts more readily with water that means there's more hydroxide ions present and so the pH would be greater compared to that of the magnesium and that is why the answer would have to be A. Now question 15 you have the sample of magnesium carbonate and it's placed in the crucible R and S. In crucible R it's um, heated and crucible S is not and then hydrochloric acid is added. So magnesium carbonate, let it decompose, you'll have magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide. Then the magnesium oxide will react with HCl give you, giving you magnesium chloride and water. Then in S it doesn't get heated so right away you're going to use magnesium carbonate plus HCl will give you magnesium chloride plus water plus carbon dioxide. So in R is there a gas produced? No, you just have water. But in S, is there a gas produced? Yes, there is. And that is why the answer is C for this question. Okay, so for question 16, which statement about nitrogen or its compounds is correct? So A tells us that the Haber process temperature is kept high to give a good equilibrium yield of ammonia. But that's incorrect because the forward reaction is exothermic. And according to Le Chatelier's principle, if one or more factors that affect an equilibrium is changed, the position of the equilibrium shifts in the direction that reduces or opposes this change. Now because we're they're saying to increase the temperature, but it's already exothermic, so it's going to do the opposite. We're going to go by the reverse reaction. That's what it's going to favor. It's going to favor producing nitrogen and hydrogen. But if we were to decrease the temperature, then it will try to oppose that and it will try to move forward because the forward reaction releases energy exothermic. So now part A is out. B, nitrogen gas has a triple bond, not a double bond. If you draw it out, it's supposed to look like that. And then for C, um, nitrogen monoxide will react with carbon monoxide under suitable conditions. That is true and the reaction will give you carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Uh, which are not as toxic as nitrogen monoxide and carbon monoxide. Then part D, the formula of ammonium sulfate is NH4SO4. That is incorrect because, as you know, SO4 is, uh, has an oxidation state of 2 minus and NH4 has oxidation of 1. So you're just going to switch those um, oxidation states and place them in the bottom. So NH4, whole of the bracket, needs to be 2 and SO4 is a one there but you don't really need to write that we never actually do that so that's how it's supposed to look so the only correct answer in this case is C so question 17 when concentrated sulfuric acid reacts with sodium iodide the products include sulfur iodine hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide so which statement is correct the first st statement is correct because if you write out the oxidation states for all of them. So it's saying that hydrogen sulfide is part of a reduction reaction. So, so here the sulfur in this case has an oxidation state of 6 plus. 
And then in the hydrogen sulfide, it's 2 minus. That is because it is more electronegative than hydrogen. And in SO2, or sulfur dioxide, it has an oxidation state of 4 plus because it is less electronegative than the oxygen. Like we said before, going to the right and up of the periodic table, electronegativity increases. So we're going to use now oil rig. Reduction or oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain. So here you can tell the gain in either case. So you see 6 to 2 minus or negative 2, it's gaining electrons. It's, become, it's becoming reduced. And so A is the only answer. If you go to B, iodide ions are stronger oxidizing agents than sulfate ions. And that's not true because iodide ions are strong reducing agents, not oxidizing agents. And then for part C, sulfur atoms from the sulfuric acid are both oxidized and reduced. No, it's only reduced like we stated before. Part D, sulfur atoms from the sulfuric acid are oxidized to make sulfur dioxide. That's not true. Like we said, they are reduced. So A is your only option. Okay, so for question 18, you should know these two uh, equations and you should memorize them and you're expected to know them. So it tells us that there are three moles of chlorine that react with a solution of sodium hydroxide and the reaction produces five moles of sodium chloride and one mole of X. And if you remember these equations, you realize that it's talking about the first one that I wrote, not the second one. And so what is that one mole of X? That is NaClO3, which is option C. Now question 19. Redox reactions are common in the chemistry of group 17. Which statement is correct? So I drew this out for you. So fluorine to iodine going down the group, the strength of the oxidation agent decreases. But then for the fluoride ion going down the group to the iodide ion, for example, that's where I'm going to stop for now, uh, the strength of the reducing agent increases. So right now we're talking about displacement reactions. So part A tells us bromide ions will reduce chlorine but not iodine. That is true because chlorine is uh, more reactive than the bromide ion and it will displace it. However, the iodine is less reactive than the bromine, the bromide ion, so it's going to not displace it. It's just no reaction, right? So part A is correct. And then B, chlorine will oxidize bromine ions but not iodine ions. That is not true. Um, it will oxidize both of them because chlorine is more reactive than the both. Fluorine is the weakest oxidizing agent. That is not true. It is the strongest, like I said before. Iodide ions are the weakest reducing agent. No, they're actually the strongest compared to the other three. So the only possible answer then is A. And finally, question 20. Structural isomerism and stereoisomerism should be considered when answering this question. So each of the following carbonyl compounds reacted with NaBH4, which is going to reduce them. And then the part of each reaction was heated with the aluminum oxide. Okay, so first I drew out butanol, which is an aldehyde. And then when it's reduced by the NaBH4, it becomes a primary alcohol. That's what it is. When aldehydes are reduced, they become primary al alcohols. So when we are using the aluminum oxide, it's a dehydrating agent. That means it gets rid of water. So we got rid of an OH and an H, it became an alkene which has double bonds. So in this case, how many products are produced? Well, it's going to be only one product, which is this. And you can't say cis trans isomerism because the hydrogens are on both sides of one of the carbons. So now part B, butanone, which is a ketone. So when you reduce a ketone, you get a secondary alcohol. And we got now two products out of this. and I just skipped the part of the aluminum, but this is what's going to show up. You're going to have this and this. So you're going to use cis trans isomerism. So you don't just have two products, you actually have four. You have cis butuene, trans butuene, cis butuene, and trans butuene. So I'm just going to draw a random example here. So you have the carbons, and on both of them, on the top side, you have a C2H5. And hydrogen, but at the bottom you have C2H5, so they're switching, and that's 
trans. And the cis is going to be when two of the same elements are on the top and two of the same elements at the bottom, for example, which is like that. So then if you were to do or to draw out the both of them, you end up with four different um, isomers. So part C, pentane 3 ohm. you're going to put the double bond O at the third carbon. You'll get a secondary alcohol, like I said. And then when you dehydrate it, you're going to get this this compound, right? And so if you realize that it's the same as the one that I drew on the other side, it's as if you just switched it or someone just flipped it. So you only have two options, or sorry, yeah, two options. So then D, you have propane 1 ohm or just propanone, which is also a ketone. And um, ketones turn into secondary alcohols, like we said before. And if you draw it out, it only has one option because it's the same thing flipped again, just like an option C. So B would be the answer because it will produce the most isomers.